The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Pat, welcome to the Australian Investors Podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Owen. Yeah, we're recording remotely. We're both in Melbourne, but we're recording remotely today. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, We'll talk about robo-advice, about portfolio construction, automation, and all of those fun things. But I'm hoping maybe we can start off with a bit of quick fire, mate. And I've got two questions for you. The first is... What's more underrated with a 10-year view, so we're talking long-term, the technology or resources sector? Uh, interesting time for that question uh, here in <laughs> late, late July. Um, I would probably answer that as slightly different in that I think I would say the, mo- the more appreciated sector from Australian investors seems to be technology in that as I look at what ShareSite and SelfWealth and others are reporting about investor behavior and, and, and trades and what people are holding, I'm actually pleased to see that um, fairly standard but but good large global uh, share ETFs are towards the top of the list. And by definition, they would be highly weighted towards technology. So I think people are using and continue to use uh, the big international ETFs as a way to get exposure to um, a diversified uh, group of companies heavily weighted to technology. Um, So I would probably say um, resources might be more underappreciated. But as I say that, there is a lot of money being invested in resources entities because we're in the midst of an energy crisis. And so I also see that, you know, BHP, Rio and others um, that are uh, suppliers in renewable energy and uh, inputs and whatnot have, have have got a lot of attention recently. But I think as far as long term, there's more appreciation for technology um, amongst mm. Australian investors at the moment. Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, and purposefully, you know, 10 year view, 
Uh, we Aussies, we love our resources sector because it tends to, even though they are cyclical, we tend to get fully frank dividends. And the technology sector, although, you know, by and large, Australia isn't that large when it comes to the technology sector, uh, we do like our technology companies and we are prepared to look abroad for that. So, and by the way, that wasn't a forecast. I wasn't trying to angle for a forecast from you. I, I wouldn't have uh, expected you to do so. But the second question from for me, mate, is uh, more of a personal one, quite an easy one. What's the best beach that you've ever surfed? I have to go, I'd have to go Bell's Beach. Um, and to <laughs> be clear, I, I, to be clear, I could never surf Bell's if it was pumping. <laughs> um, but I did <laughs> surf it once when it was, um, when the locals probably thought it was too small. And um, I was able to get away there. And it's just, it's so iconic and so beautiful. Um, that memory will never leave my mind. Bells Beach here in Victoria down uh, near Torquay. It's a fantastic spot. Uh, it's it's definitely a place where you would go if you're, you're a keen surfer. Maybe not so much if you're a, a beach goer or you have toddlers or something like that. Uh, there are plenty of other beaches nearby. Jan Jock comes to mind. Um, mate, that's great. I, uh, I, I like to start these uh, interviews by going back in time a bit and trying to understand the person that has created an investment strategy or investment company like yourself and just understand a bit more about how you got to where you are today. So uh, what what was a young Pat like? Did you want to get into investing? Did you have mentors in business or finance? How did that? How did this come to be? I think the underpinnings of an interest in investing uh, and the mechanics of that existed with me at a young age, but didn't manifest till a little bit later. In that, I, in that, I went to uni and studied engineering uh, and commerce. Um, but as a young kid, I was really interested in puzzles. I, I'm much more of an analytic, mathematical mind than, um, I guess you might call the liberal liberal arts in the states. So, I enjoyed building things. I enjoyed trying to figure out how different pieces of um, activities fit together, and just uh, that's just the way my mind always worked as a kid, which is which is in part probably what led me into, in, into the in engineering degree. Um, investing was something I knew of and was from, w- was familiar with, but I didn't, I, I didn't have an, a, a super keen early interest in it because I didn't have money to invest. Um, and so then I go off uh, to uni and then I get to New York and um, I was actually in the operations area of New York for a little while. And, um, uh, it wasn't until a little later of my time there that I actually had some savings to invest, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But I think it was mainly just um, the, the analytic aspect of investing, and then as far as the business, it's, it was really the interest in, in creating and building things. Mm. So, out of out of school, did did you out of uni? Did you go and work as an engineer at all, or did you did you move straight into the like the operation side of finance and investing? Yeah, I went, I went, um, so I, one of the things I learned in engineering school at the University of Virginia was that I probably didn't want to be an engineer, but I was quite grateful for the skills that I learned. Um, I, I, my major was something called systems engineering, which is probably most closely aligned with what management consultants do in terms of, again, that sort of the analytic rigor of breaking complex things down into the simple components, figuring out how they all interrelate and then being able to manage that better or optimally. And, uh, but I didn't want to necessarily be an engineer. So I had a, co- a minor in commerce and, um, and sort of a comedic story, I, um, which I won't elaborate on. I, I did end up managing to get a job at JP Morgan in New York uh, in the, inside the, the management consulting, effectively the management consulting um, arm, which was kind of sat next to the f- corporate finance and M&A and whatnot. It wasn't an easy role to get, but I had the right background for it. I didn't necessarily have the right background school-wise uh, to get what was at the time, this is 1989, uh, probably the hardest job to get as a college grad in America, which was a finance internship at JP Morgan on Wall Street. So I didn't need, I didn't try, I, I got a foot in the other door um, and then managed to sort of meander my way across. but. Um, no, I went straight in, two, in 2000 and, um, 1990 into, uh, up to New York and was there for 10 years at J.P. Morgan. So you're in this like business consulting. Um, is this what later morphed into uh, private equity? 
Well, that was the end point. So I'll give you a sort of a condensed version of the journey from internal management consulting to private equity. Um, after a couple of years in the internal sort of consulting aspect of the business, I, I, at that point I did, I was immersed in the financial world, but I wasn't working on the front line of the financial um, stream of activities for JP Morgan, whether it was investment banking or investing investment management. And so uh, I pestered the person who had to go out on a limb, uh, who was managing basically the, um, the junior analysts. And I pestered the person who was responsible for saying, okay, Pat can go from the operating environment into the finance environment. Uh, it took about a year. <laughs> I think I, I, I annoyed the, I annoyed the heck out of him for a year because um, I, I just think he thought I I didn't know what I'd be getting myself into. And it was just sort of something that I thought might be kind of glamorous when, in fact, I, I had a really keen interest for it. So eventually he relented and uh, threw me into debt capital markets as an analyst, which was a new stream of business for JP Morgan. This is in early in the early 90s. And it would be fair to say that that was a stressful, hard environment to work in, in terms of um, the group getting it, it, that group getting new business for JP Morgan. And I was doing the grunt work, uh, the very grunt work. And I survived a year. And uh, so the guy said, OK, we'll we'll try you in investment banking. And if you survive there, we'll put you through some more formal training. Uh, and somehow I managed to get through that uh, investment banking and M&A world for um, for a couple of years, worked on some interesting transactions. But again, I was I was building sheets. I was um, uh, built uh, putting together PowerPoint presentations. I was doing what you know, running around all hours of night doing whatever it took. So it wasn't particularly glamorous, but I was a sponge learning. Um, and then I did have an interest after a few years of that in exploring what this private equity business was that JP Morgan had. And that's when I think the confluence of um, uh, that con uh, of being in immersed in an entrepreneurial environment in, the, in, 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 in this instance, being the sources of capital for, for startups, as well as like leverage buyouts and whatnot, the whole realm of private equity. And that's when I really started to think I, I, I want to get involved in sort of in the investment in the investment side in some way. So I landed in the private equity um, uh, business of JP Morgan in around 1996 or so. And I had, and that was when private equity was just becoming a really big asset class globally. It was sort of a cottage industry till then, but then all of a sudden it was taking off. And I had the good fortune of timing uh, and luck in that I landed there before they handed that business over to a gentleman named Brian Watson, who was. Uh, a very senior member of the executive team of JP Morgan globally. And they, they, his remit was to build that business, to grow the private equity business. And I was a junior grunt. So whatever bullets were flying around above me um, didn't hit my head. So I ended up surviving the, um, the reformation and growth of that business. And it was through that, that I built a, a really good working relationship. And I'm, you know, to this day, probably the luckiest, uh, business development and, or career development for me was um, getting Brian as a, as a mentor and and learning how he thinks, how he invests, um, uh, the, the measure of calm you bring to uh, stressful situations, et cetera, et cetera. So, and he's from what Brian was originally uh, grew up in South Melbourne, poached from uh, Woodside Petroleum by J.P. Morgan and brought over to New York. So, uh, eventually, he moved his family back to New York in around 2000. Uh, all of his kids were born in the States and he wanted them to have some time in Australia. And I followed him over in 2001 for what I thought would be, because um, New York had started to tire me out at that point. Uh, I moved over in 2001 to work with Brian in the Australian private equity arm of JP Morgan uh, for what I thought was gonna be one or, one or two years. So it was kind of a cool thing to do, to come to this crazy wild place that I hadn't spent much time in Australia be involved in private equity, work with a guy who I knew and respected and was fortunate to work with. I'll do that for a year or two and then head back to the States. And that was 21 years ago. Um, I still haven't been kicked out. <laughs> can I uh, can I just circle back? Uh, you said, you know, you're in the, the debt capital markets part of JP Morgan there for a year and then in investment banking for three years. Can you give us a sense of kind of 
the the work environment. A lot of people that listen to the show do think about the glitz and the glamour of investment banking, and they think of it as you know very lucrative. Um, maybe some some of them do know how intense it is. But can you shed any light on that for us? Yeah, sure. Um, it's probably changed a bit because it was a little while ago that I was there, but I think some aspects of it haven't changed given w- what I read and hear about. Uh, it is a very, very stressful and difficult work environment um, where you, you work very long hours. Um, a, 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 as a junior resource, you work you work very long, stressful hours. Um, it is very cutthroat. Uh, I, I just re- remember at some point, um, there were nights when I'd go home at five in the morning, take a shower, put a suit on, and go back go back in when there was a de- when there was a, a deal that we, a business we were trying to win, and that's because Morgan Stanley was across the street from J.P. Morgan, and if we didn't work that hard, they would, and they might get the mandate. So that that's a bit of an extreme example, um, but not highly uncommon uh, in terms of the hours. And as for the so you do that to try to work on deals that close as opposed to those that don't uh, for people who have influence and sway within an organization. So your career trajectory can move up because you're getting paid decent coin when you're that, when you're a junior, you know, when you're that sort of analyst and junior role and associate, but New York isn't cheap. So you're not exactly saving squillions of dollars um, at all. So, the aspiration, if you've got the temperament, the desire, the adrenaline and everything else is, you know, to get to this, you know, more senior levels where the, the compensation becomes, you know, more significant, which it which which it is. I always had a bit of a mental uh, probably debate with myself. I've got a brother who's uh, a teacher of 35 years and the disparity between what, you know, the teachers are t- teachers who were having what I would argue is a pretty big impact on society, um, what they get paid versus what people who eventually get to the top echelons of Wall Street get paid. But that's for another discussion. Um, I kind of I, I kind of started to chip into that slightly higher level, but I never got to the really super high level of executive stuff at, at JP Morgan. I was mainly in the um, l- l- learn and get whatever experience I could get because I sort of back backdoored my way into finance. But um, I'll just mention real quickly, it was about 1997, uh, about seven years through my time there that my father passed away. That was the time that I probably got a paycheck where I had a a few bucks outside of what what we would call super here um, to invest. And that was when I really, um, because in private equity, you're investing JP Morgan's balance sheet uh, or a, you know a, a fund that JP Morgan's raised, and your job is to do that well. But it's not you know it's not your personal money, um, and and not your mom's uh, livelihood. So when my dad passed away, I had to take his investments, which were eight or ten kind of blue chip um, American company, General Motors, uh, uh, Marriott hotels, and whatnot, and I had to reconfigure dad's portfolio into something that would be more suitable for my mom. And that was a bit of an eye opener for me because I hadn't, I hadn't really had to do that before. And I can unpack that a little bit in terms of the, that that was my first experience of putting together a very well diversified portfolio using index funds, thinking about a time horizon and a risk profile. Um, Because, and, and it took a little while and it was really hard. It was much harder than somebody who had the experience that I had um, it was harder than I thought it would be and should be. And it was stressful because this was, you know, a parent, uh, you know, a parent's livelihood who had to pay bills and what's the right mix of income versus growth and how, how long the horizon are we talking about? Um, so there needs to be a measure of growth, but if, you know, if there's a five year bear market, then I'm, I'm not going to sleep at night and think I screwed up my mom's f- financial set- setup. So, I did spend a lot of time at that point thinking about portfolio construction, portfolio management. Index funds at that point were really becoming big in the States. This is, again, 1997, so 20, 25 years ago. Um, and it was a really quick jump into the deep end of uh, hands-on asset uh, investment management 
and both personally as well as you know family. So anyway, that was that was probably the one of the most salient, um, impactful twelve months or so of of of, of my life. So that was ninety seven, and there was a lot of market volatility in the aftermath of that, and um, probably it, it was the, the initial underpinnings of what eventually became um, Six Park in, in in terms of the Bo Advice Service. Thinking about where there should be a better solution. I, if I if if I found it hard, I thought to myself, then people who don't know what an index fund or how shares work, how the heck are they going to get help? Um, mm. And that was you know that was one of the motiv- motivating factors behind setting up the business. Pat, um, people would probably hear that and think if you're working for J.P. Morgan and you're working on Wall Street, you know, investment banker. Surely that would be so easy and so simple um, for you to design a portfolio for your family. Like that's probably what the outsider's view is. And I'm more curious, maybe not so much with that one, but more so with if you are in the cockpit of Wall Street, you've got you know experts around you, you are an expert yourself. How did you make the decision to go with index funds? Um, I was I was immersed in Wall Street, but I wasn't immersed in picking one stock over the other. Um, and I wasn't immersed in active active investment management. When you make a private equity investment, you're making it for seven to 10 years. So, and, and, and we built a portfolio of private equity f- investments across different um, geographies, industries and whatnot. So, so I did have a good appreciation for diversification for Company analysis and 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 people analysis because in private equity usually the success is typically defined by people as opposed to market opportunity. Usually the idea is okay; it's whether the people can do it or not. So um, to your question, Owen, I think um, I wasn't a professional money manager, even though I was in Wall Street. Um, professional money managers on Wall Street make up a, a, a I I don't want to say a sliver. Um, there's a lot of activities that happen on Wall Street in addition to active fund management. And so I, I would have had to you know, quit my job and say, I want to, I want to become a fund manager. Um, and I didn't want to do that in part because I learned during that moment, uh, during those times that I mentioned earlier, it's bloody hard. And if you're then going to do that um, uh, with individual stocks, for all of your assets, then you're going to be looking at those every day. You're going to wake up and you're going to read the paper. And if you see a name of one of your companies, you, you know, you're either going to pat yourself on the back or shit yourself. That's a daily experience I didn't want to go through. Um, so particularly given it was my mom's financial livelihood, uh, putting together a, a basket of ETFs and in, in the U.S. those are like state and county bonds, a variety of things. That were well diversified, and you know, the like inter, uh, Vanguard's international shares fund here at over fifteen hundred companies. I'd much rather have that be something that you know, both in my mom's case and mine now, where I feel like I'm maybe not going to get the side of jagging one of my uh, stock selections, but I'd much rather take a good blended composition of different asset classes. So it just, I, I just think it makes life well. First of all, it's, it there's a lot of evidence that suggests that over the mid to long term, it's um, low fees and diversification are probably going to get you the best outcome. Sort of along the lines of oh, and how, what you would articulate as your core your core strategy. And I and I really liked reading about your investment philosophy. And and so mainly long long winded way of saying I I didn't want to take on the stress, time, and and um, behavior, behavioral challenges that that active stock pick to, for the core. The core aspect of, of, of my and my mom's assets. Mm, fair enough, I like it. Um, so, what? So you arrive in Australia and uh, you're 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 down here. You know at least one person, and you're working in private equity. Can you take us through, I guess, that period of your life up until the where the origin story of Six Park begins? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, one of the things, uh, as I, my time in Australia started to expand, one of the things I talked with Brian about, um, for a number of years, actually, 
was the prospect of he and I uh, start, starting up our own business. Because Brian, at this point, he was on the, uh, the the original board of guardians for the future fund. So doing effectively asset allocation with the country's sovereign wealth fund. Um, and he's a little bit older than I am. So he was, he was, he was not really in an operating environment. He, he wasn't in an operator company mode, but very much in a sort of a mentor chairman um, advisor mode. So he and I had talked about the idea of, 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 of creating our own business because um, we'd been sort of funding or advising others businesses for, for, for ages. What we, where I would be fundamentally the, the operator of the business and Brian would be in, a, in a more of like a chairman capacity. What we needed, Owen, is we needed the idea. Um, we needed the business idea and the, the business opportunity. So at this point, Six Park and Robo wasn't in the brain. Yep, this is, you know, 2010 to 2014. Every time I went to the States to visit family, I would always go over and think what I want to I want to identify a trend in the States that's going to be a big trend in Australia in five years, because um, there's the idea that Brian and I can you know, capitalize and have a have a crack at. And if it, if it, if it goes well, great. If not, I, I can say we tried. We can say we tried. Um, so there was a period of time where, where, where I, I, I struggled and, you know, notepads on planes and whatnot, long plane flights. Um, but there was. Um, there was a moment in 2014 when the ETF market in Australia was starting to really um, become more significant and, and relevant. And Brian and I, both on a personal and professional level, could, could see the major problem in Australia, more acute than overseas, of it being too hard, too confusing, too expensive. Um, if people could even get um, a, a quote, so to speak, to get to get investment help, um, to get advice, uh, not just a menu of choices, um, but actual tell us a little bit about yourself and answer some important, you know, salient questions. And we're not going to solve all your financial problems. We're not going to give you a holistic statement of advice about what to do with this and insurance and super and estate planning. But if if you just, you know, we do one thing, we would do one thing really, really well, um, in my view. We've got a good group of people um, to help construct a portfolio uh, if somebody has some money to invest. And we thought that the, the ETFs are now there to construct portfolios in Australia on the ASX. Um, I learned very quickly what an API was in terms of um, the technology required to deliver um, uh, a risk assessment and uh, trades and portfolio construction. And if we build it, rebalancing, um, automated, automated rebalancing, automated onboarding portals so clients can see their holdings, so on and so forth. Um, that was the idea. Can we, if we built something like that, that would be high utility in Australia if, 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 if people like it and want it and use it. And we could see it happening overseas. Um, and Australia is, you know, on the financial services front, is typically a little bit behind what, you know, accelerates a, a overseas and, and, and in parts of Europe. So anyway, so we thought, given, given the asset allocation expertise, uh, which is an important one, um, that Brian and at the time, who he had envisioned pulling together as an investment committee, and me kind of going out and saying, "Can, can we build a tech platform that will um, an application and service that will do all this stuff in a in a you know at least mostly automated way? Because otherwise, you can't charge a low fee because you've got too many costs all over the place, uh, and you want to scale it up. So you need you need automation." Um, so we did like a you know a year's worth of proving this thing out um, and putting together the different pieces for trading and reporting and and rebalancing and a, 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 a lot of spreadsheets that I still have on uh, asset allocation and rebalancing. Built a mean variance optimizer to work uh, that the investment committee would use uh, if, if if we got to the point of building and launching, and which we did uh, obviously. Which so this is about 2014 to 2016. So we got the idea. We got very excited and passionate about it because we could see the need, and we thought this is 
this is exactly what we should be doing, right? Given the background, given our background, and importantly, both Brian and I shared an investment philosophy about um, low fees and diversification being the two, two most important decisions an investor can make. Um, there's a lot of factors, obviously, but those two really resonated with us. And so, if we can automate a way that um, people can access that at, at an accessible and affordable price point. That, that really got us fired up. So we built it and we launched it in 2016 and um, uh, thr thrilled with how it's going. Awareness and adoption of ETFs and, and digital services is, it has been increasing sort of every, you know, each year. It's kind of following the trajectory of what's happened overseas where people have, um, investors, and it's not just people on, um, and I, you probably know this, but it's not just people who are starting their investment journey. Obviously, that is a very, very important segment of the market because those people need help and they're typically young. So if they're, if they're making either poor or uninformed because there aren't any ways for them to learn, a few bucks law opportunity cost today is a, is a lot of money in 25 years. So that's an important segment. But we also have there's also people, and we have them as clients, that have millions of dollars, and all they want is a simple, simple but effective portfolio that they understand that they have line of sight on. They can see what the asset classes are. They can see how the diversification works. They can see through up, up and down market cycles the power of that diversification and, and reinvesting dividends, et cetera, et cetera. So it is sort of a mass market solution, but it... Um, it, it can cater to a lot of different people uh, depending on what they need. So anyway, that's sort of how we went from, gee, we should start up a business someday to the idea to then building it and and then getting Lindsay Tanner and Mark Nicholson on the investment committee. Because the, the last point I'll make on that, Owen, is one of the things that we wanted to, to make be special about our business was it's not easy, but you can automate all the stuff that I mentioned, the risk assessment into onboarding, creating account portals, this and that. It's easier said than done, but it's, you know, obviously it's doable. But ultimately people give us their money to invest and generate a return. So you do need a measure of expertise in figuring out what asset allocations and which ETFs to choose. And I, I built a few formulas and algorithms for things, but I, and a mean variance optimizer, which is for those who may not be aware, is sort of a highly analytical tool where you can put in different types of investments, expected risk and return, and and say what your goal is as far as um, volatility or returns, and it will kind of give you a suggested asset allocation across uh, based on what you know, domestic shares, international shares, property, um, et cetera, et cetera. That is just a tool that should inform a decision but not be the decision because by definition every mean variance optimizer is going to be a little bit subject to the assumptions you make and sensitive to them so what you really want is a group of individuals that take that and then say okay let, let's uh, let's apply our real world experience and see if you know see if we want to tweak some, you know, some things around the edges because this thing is a tool but it's not perfection and that's where our investment committee we wanted people we wanted our clients whether it's the first couple thousand or, or substantially more to know that there's people behind it looking um, looking at look, looking after the inputs into the automation. As, as Lindsay said in one of our first investment committee meetings, um, which I'll never forget, he said, you can't build an algorithm for Trump. And what he meant by that was, well, it's sort of self, self-evident, but we, we had to make a lot of um, investment decisions or decisions not to do something to our portfolios when... Donald Trump was elected, which was something that a lot of people didn't think was going to happen. And this isn't a political statement. It's just a statement about the time. There was a lot of people worrying, worrying about what does this what does this mean about shares and global markets and the, the global economy? And broadly speaking, how should I change things? Our answer was, don't you know, you don't change anything at the, at the time. You, you know, you don't change anything in your port. We were we didn't change anything in our portfolio construction because presidents typically don't drive global economic and share market. So it's stuff like that that we wanted to ensure that there were there was a good team of people sitting on top of the automation. So 
uh, I'll stop there. That was sort of the construction of the service and launched in 2016. Um, and it's been, it's been a heck of a lot of fun. It's fascinating just to hear you speak there, Pat. I was, as you were doing that, I was actually looking at some of our survey responses. So um, we have our own membership services and uh, within that, um, we have one that does like fun research and whatever. And what's fascinating when you talked about not just being new people to the platform, that like you can go in with thousands of dollars, you can go and get a six park account, or you can go in with hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Um, and we see that playing out with ETFs more broadly as well across our investor base. About one in five of our um, investors that focus on ETFs have been investing for more than 10 years. So I think, it, at least for me, it was a surprise that uh, so many investors are very experienced or rely almost solely on ETFs as their vehicle to grow wealthy, which is really, which was, it caught me off guard. And across our, all of our memberships, ETFs are more popular than individual shares now. And I just think that's, you know, I think a lot of people that when I speak to them, Pat, they are active investors and they don't comprehend that, how big this shift has been. Um, um, maybe if we, if we can just for a moment, Maybe just explore what we were talking about off air before we hit record about how you see Six Park and the industry shifting in the future and how the mix of um, actors and different stakeholders in our industry might change through time. In terms of how those services are delivered and therefore what does it what what, what do people's investments approach look like in you know mm. in, in the in the coming years? I think exactly um, I think we're going in Australia through a really um, exciting transformation and transformation has by definition always has its bumps in the road, but ultimately is leading into a better place. Um, the banking and financial services industry obviously has uh, had a few issues over the last several years. And so there has been, a, a lot of review of the way in which people uh, receive financial services, in particular financial advice. And I think we're at a point now where the innovation to drive better, more efficient, more accessible, um, and when I say better, I mean um, you know good user experience, transparent, and, and all that comes with services that people want to, on the financial services side, where innovation has caught up to the need and a fairly um, archaic industry is it's sort of that's just sort of like tur like turning the titanic is in fact sort of starting to turn so and and probably just bringing that to life a little bit o overseas a few years ago the likes of jp morgan Gold goldman sachs morgan stanley credit swiss uh, hsbc e e even walmart and others have started to get into the realm of digital financial tools and services uh, to reach the next generation of investors. Uh, because there's gonna be an intergenerational wealth transfer um, of trillions of dollars over the next 10 years or so. And so in existing incumbent financial institutions are gonna have to, I, I, I think, learn how to serve that cohort soon as in now, um, or innovative companies with institutions will do that and, and, and start to take those people away from you know, the big banks and other large institutions. So what I think we'll see in a few years is the combination of a number of these services into a more seamless experience for, um, for people where earlier in their wealth creation journey, they are getting what is right now a bit ad hoc and hard to kind of make heads or tails of, but it's sort of starting to weed itself out. Budgeting tools, access to, 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 to platforms like yours that give them insights, I won't use the word advice, insights, information, uh, and tools to learn about investing and, and shares and whatnot. Uh, services to help construct and build portfolios. Um, obviously we've seen the advent of low cost trading platforms now in Australia, which um, has been an incredibly rapid development in the, in, in the grand scheme of things over the last three or four years from $15 being wildly low given, given um, the track record in the industry to you know free in some instances now. 
that's both a good that's a good thing that's also a kind of a dangerous thing um because people can be reckless if things are free so um and then what i think will happen is people will be able to access financial advice during the bespoke pieces of their wealth journey so for, uh investment management accumulation uh phase estate planning uh, retirement planning um, it won't just be that there's one point in time when you have a whole bunch of money that you get, you finally are able to go get help on that front. There'll be a continuum of this. And right now it's pretty disparate all over the place. And so it's kind of hard for people to figure out because we all have jobs and stresses in our lives and um, not, you know, not everyone can immerse themselves in, 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 the, in, in their wealth management um, activities. So what, what, what I see is the transformations starting. I see government actually really starting to put its weight behind the desire for, to, to in, innovate with the customer in mind, which has not always been the case in this industry. Um, the regulator doing the same. Um, and we're seeing a few of the big banks um, start to talk, I think, a, more, a bit more genuinely about adopting technology to get help for people that need it. Um, and I would expect you'll see non-financial services uh, or, or entities providing wealth tools uh, to their consumer base. I guess the finance, uh, financial wellness, as you put it, uh, becoming more of, I guess, ubiquitous yeah. throughout the ecosystem. So whether you go to a, an airline's you know, loyalty program and get access to a wealth platform that way, or whether you go onto Woolies or Coles website and you, yeah. you access it that way. Yeah. Um, that's, I think it's a fascinating thing. And I think that as we finance as we know it today is not going to be what we know it as in 10 years. It'd be obviously remnants of it, but the more cutting edge will be totally different. And I'm really excited for that. Yeah. Um, if I could quickly loop back through your investment philosophy and process, Pat, um, one of the things that, when I've spoken to other people in the industry about Six Park, one of the things that often is brought up is that um, you've never invested in gold, at least as far as I know. So I'm wondering when you do your, your, your mean optimization, uh, mean variance optimization, and you, you look through your asset allocation, why that never factored in yeah, to yeah. The asset allocation? Um, it's, it's a good question. Um, so we, we assess that when we launched and we continue to assess it because like we would at any other asset class as we do with any with other asset classes. The, the relatively short answer, Owen, is when we construct our, constructed and continue to manage our portfolios, we prefer growth and defensive asset classes that we feel like we've got a certain level of understanding about the risk reward profile. And on the defensive side of asset classes, we really want income. Um, so let me preface all this. We don't think gold is a bad investment for a portfolio. It's just we prefer to do things. Um, we prefer to use other components instead of gold. So to be clear, it's not like uh, we don't think it's a good asset class per se. It's just we have a preference otherwise. So we have a preference uh, for defensive asset classes to generate income, which gold does not. We also did a pretty deep dive on the performance of gold over time, both actual just the price of gold, uh, as well as some of the exchange traded funds that track it both in the US and, 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 and in particular uh, here in Australia. And what we found is that it's got more volatility than some people might think, that the case that it's a hedge against inflation works sometimes, but sometimes doesn't, depending on the backdrop. When we put sort of all of that together, what we prefer is to, if, you know, let's say we were going to have a 10% allocation to gold, we'd rather take a portion of that 10 into a growth asset that we know and understand and another, and, the, you know, the remaining and the defensive asset that we know and understand, both of which are generating income um, and both of which are relatively w well understood from our perspective. Um, so that's where we that's where we landed, and we continue to sort of reflect on that. Um, and like I said, with with any asset class that we feel becomes prudent for adding to our portfolios, because we've done this over time, we added infrastructure uh, at one point, global infrastructure listed. Um, we'll think about it, but we haven't gotten there yet. And what does that mean? It means when gold when it has its moment, when it shines, so to speak, it's a real tailwind in, in portfolio performance. 
And when gold sort of languishes, and it can have long periods where it does that, um, it, it's had a uh, well. This is the price of gold. The price of gold has had a you know had a ten year period where it was flat, and during those ten years, there was not a dividend paid. So um, again, that was the price of gold, not the ETF here in Australia. We are long term portfolio managers, and so what we determined was on balance gold's a drag on performance over time it, it works really well for windows and then it less well for other longer slightly longer windows that was our that was our conclusion um so it's obviously it's been it's done well recently and you know it, we would expect it to i found i've found it interest, interesting that um it's performed well the last couple of years and then it, some of the times when the inflation fears were at their most acute it it retreated and i just could never you know there's some aspects to its performance that i don't i don't fully understand which is part of the reason we sort of decided to go another way no, that's fair enough i just i just see it as a um i guess a point of differentiation for you as well um yeah. and and gold tends to be a quite a polarizing thing for that very reason for a long time i've i've thought very similar to you in that um, I did, probably don't need gold in a portfolio um, as a long-term investor. I probably don't need it to construct a portfolio, um, but I acknowledge at certain times it has worked and over time the price of gold has gone up. Um, but One of our investment committee members, um, Mark Nicholson, was was on the investment committee of the World Bank, uh, the banking division of the World Bank, and I think he he he, sum, he summarized it succinctly and well in, 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 in many ways like you just did, Owen, where he saw, where he has seen in his career, and it's it's a um, it's an impressive career. Where he's seen gold utilized most is by you know hedge fund managers that will choose it when when they're making a bet before others that it's going to outperform. So there is th there is some real alpha seeking with it um, by professional managers. Um, obviously, retail investors will use it as well, but where he's seen the most activity with it is is that use case. Um, otherwise, it's a little bit more of an insurance kind of insurance play. The insurance part being the drag that I talked about. So neither one of those kind of fit into how we manage portfolios. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd add because Mark always has in interesting insights on these things. Yeah, no, I like it. Um, and I do see it personally, whether it's on the advisor side or on the um, active management side, whether it's private investors or professionals, I do see it as more a tactical shift, um, whether that's for alpha or whether it's to hedge against something and then therefore alpha. Um, that's where I see it being used. Uh, I put a more product centric question for you, Pat, which is just that if I could ask you to pick one of these that have been most powerful or uh, had the most powerful impact on your clients, and I'm being, I'm giving you a false choice here. Uh, I've got automation, investment philosophy, or I guess security selection slash investment process, depending on how you want to think about that. So we've got automation, your investment philosophy, or your security selection. Which one do you think has had the most powerful impact on your clients? I think the most powerful impact would be the investment philosophy, because ultimately people are giving us. Uh, trusting us with money to invest for them. So um, we've we benchmark ourselves a variety of ways. The, probably the most meaningful way that we're able to is by looking at a database of managed funds, multi-asset class managed funds, and we can see growth defensive splits. So we can line this up against ours and say, how how are we doing against comps? And we've regularly outperformed sort of 80, if not 90 percent of those on a, on a on a regular basis since since we went into the market sort of six years ago. And so that I'm, pr I'm, I'm very proud of that. I think it's a combination of low low fees and that investment oversight to make you know good decisions at the right time or, or decisions not to do anything, if that's the case. So I think that the. the and I hope it's appreciated, but um, when markets are down, I, you, you don't know what, whether people realize, what, think they're getting good, good investment uh, guidance or not. But um, I think we've delivered strong returns, and that's probably the most important thing we're supposed to be doing for people. So that would be the thing that comes to my mind. I think as far as if we, if we were to ask our clients, they'd, 
the automation is probably part of it because I spend a, I try to spend a lot of time talking with clients because it helps inform product development and and feature enhancements and whatnot. And the thing that I hear probably more than anything is um, the concept that it's it's like set and forget, but with an adult overlay, keeping an eye on things to tweak when necessary. And and in that mind, there's both the technology automation, but also the I, I've I've given it to you guys to just let it let it do a thing. I can retake this is a client speaking. I can retake the assessment if I think my risk profile might have changed or if. I just got fired, so my time horizon for this money is now two years instead of 22 years. So I, I, I need to retake the assessment and this and that. I think that automating and and and, and building transparency and how that works has probably peace peace of mind um, has probably mm. been the, the bit of feedback I've gotten most from people. It's actually interesting because this is, segues perfectly into my next question, which was about behavioral biases. And um, you may know that Teddy Richards, former employee of yours, uh, was on the show, or it's actually on our Australian finance podcast or our other channel, but he talked about behavioural biases. And um, uh, just maybe, you know, as more people adopt um, robo-advice or more people adopt ETFs and passive investing in general, what do, you, what do you see as being, I guess, some of the more powerful psychological biases that people should be aware of? It's a really good question and one that I would encourage anyone listening um, I know you have a uh, you have a range of very sophisticated audience and probably people who are fairly new. I would say for anyone, it's always good to revisit what behavioral traps there are for investors because because no, no one is immune to those, um, whether ex- experienced or not. And I say that from personal experience. So, um, but I think today, as we sit talking today, Owen, um, three that come to mind. Um, one would be, and, and I don't know how this would be sort of technically framed in, in an academic behavioral finance book, but it uh, ha- has to do with patience and mm. uh, managing emotions. And the way I see that is is uh, people make plan when, when things are reasonably sort of stable and markets are kind of grinding their way up and and and, and there aren't any like huge traumas in in, in the world. Uh, people set plans for themselves from a finance and investing perspective. And they'll sit and spend a lot of time and answer questions of themselves and and their goals and their time horizons and whatnot. They put together a plan and implement it. And then the, the doo-doo hits the fan, you know, and something mm-hmm. wacky happens. Uh, and all of a sudden that plan is just gone. And it might be right that there should be some adjustments to the plan, but it shouldn't just go out the window. And a lot of, so a lot of people I think need to really um, check those emotions and, and, and remember that um, trading is a short-term game, but investing is a long-term game and investing rewards the patient. So th- that would probably be uh, one of them. Another one that's sort of a, you know, an obvious, well, not an obvious, it's always an obvious one. The, the, the concept of the her- follow the crowd, the herd mentality. Um, mm. they, they, they're, you know, talk a lot about GameStop and all these other things and, 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 and um, where there have been fads or trends. One thing I did learn on time in New York and Wall Street and, 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 and just anecdotally from people, more times than not when there's a major trend or hot space or, or whatever you want to call it. Professional money is already gone there and prices already reflect so, to some extent the run up in, in, in that, whatever that might be. So either one of two things is going to happen. Most, most, you know, a lot of investors will be getting in a bit late and therefore the upside is, isn't as great as they may think. Or the fad or the trend is exactly that, a fad or a trend. And just because a whole bunch of people are throwing money in it doesn't mean it could just fall, you know, the thesis could fall over the next day. So do, do your homework. Um, does the, does the uh, if, you're, if you're doing something that there is in fact a, a herd charging at, uh, have a really, really thoughtful consideration as to um, if you strip out the herd, do the fundamentals s- still hold? Um, and if the herd shifts and goes in another direction, are you going to follow them, or do you are are, are you are, are you comfortable with 
your decision because if you're not that says something so that would that would be a second um a third would just be generally speaking overconfidence which is you know frequently thrown into the behavior, behavioral finance mix um you won't be surprised to hear me say oh and i think investing is really hard uh given my comments earlier when uh on my own hmm. experience P- picking stocks 15 20 years ago um there was a ability to get an information edge so professional fund managers active managers and re- and retail investors uh, could eventually avail themselves of information that if they worked hard enough could could inform a decision that other people might not get to information's everywhere now in fact there's almost too much information around so um it's really challenging to find an edge it can be done if you've got the time temperament interest it can be done um, i really like the way you frame in your investment philosophy like the the core kind of passive piece the um uh like the the rask ring maybe if i don't know if that's what you call it but sort of kind of how you try to mm. really thoughtfully and analytically um make you know very measured assessments of of of, of, of some um investments to make and then outside of that is a bit of the you having a bit of a flyer um and i think there's a home for all of those uh very much a home for all of those including that last one and to me that's when i get the calls all the time does six park have crypto in his board now we don't have cryptos in our portfolios um if you want to do if you want to do crypto go for your life but i wouldn't put all your assets into crypto and if you want sort of a core um this might make you sleep sleep a little bit better because crypto can be kind of volatile so um coming back to my third point overconfidence a lot of people who are newer to them into the market now um uh, up until you know a few months ago have basically just seen like markets grind up for 10 years um, and at the tail end of that a pretty speculative you know kind of spike particularly right after covid in march and feb a uh, feb march of 2020 when we had the quickest correction in the his- history of markets followed by the quickest rebound and i think there were a lot of people and a lot of people at that time getting access to low cost brokerage in, in cash and going well this is actually not that hard right we've just had you know we're in a pandemic and i'm making money um that doesn't that's not how it always works and people will be learning that now i am actually quite glad to hear some of the stuff out of w- your comment about etfs uh same out of self wealth and share site some of the others that are giving uh, some commentary about their, their their customer behavior. There does seem to be a measure of patience and long term long term thinking with investors through the utilization of ETFs and importantly, which ETFs. It's not you know it's not the some of the more specky things. It's you know it's the big global established large um, diversified ETF. So anyway, overconfidence. Um, I guess I would just close out saying investing requires humility. It re- requires conviction and a variety of other things. Um but it also re- it, it also requires humility that it's hard. I like it Pat. So you've got patience or maybe impatience uh being advised. Yeah, yeah you've got yeah. herd mentality and you've got <laughs> overconfidence. Um I really like it. I I love these conversations and I think they're more important and I think we're, they're going to be more prevalent as more investors think carefully about their asset allocation because that becomes their primary decision um, that they make, uh, particularly, like you said, in the core of a portfolio. I've got one final question. Actually, I've got two questions, Pat. First one is, yeah. a quick one, why did you call it Six Park? One of the most difficult things about setting up the business was coming up with a name. Phenomenally difficult. Um, <laughs> we... we we had all sorts of ideas. They were either taken or they, they, they know, uh, that there wasn't un, 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 unanimity about um, whether we liked them or not. You know, all these, you know, rocket ship, this, that, that all these names you t- typically hear of these uh, types of businesses. There was a name um, that was personal to me in that, uh, that that just kind of made the cut until the end and we stuck with it. Six Park is the address of, of our of a family beach house in the little state of Delaware on the East Coast that my grandparents bought. And it's a 80 year old, uh, fairly large, but not modern beach house that my grandparents got when my uh, grandfather retired from, from the army. And uh, they said, 
all family is coming to us now. We're not going to go traveling around the world seeing family come to us. So we had the good fortune as grandkids of spending our summers uh, at this big old beach house with all the aunts and uncles and grandparents and whatnot. It was um, it was sort of paradise for us. And one of the things about it was that it was a place that I personally felt quite safe um, because there were adults sort of always kind of running around just making sure things um, didn't get out of hand. Uh, so I felt kind of safe and secure there. The house weathered a, a, a lot of massive easters, which are big storms on the east coast of the U.S. And for, for me personally, it just sort of resonated with exactly what I wanted the business to do, which was let people know that it's got a sturdy foundation, that there's adults looking after things, uh, that you can enjoy life and not worry about, you know, the stuff you don't need to worry about. So that um, that's where we ended up landing. Um, and that's the background of that mm. one. I like it. I like it. Um, okay, final question, Pat, yeah. is if you could go back and tell younger you one thing about money, finance, or investing, what would it be? I'll keep this one simple. Start, start earlier. Um, I mentioned earlier that when you live in New York, you can be on Wall Street, but if you're not in one of the sort of super high flying jobs, uh, after tax, you know, you're not saving a lot of money. If if I if I were telling myself something, again, it's pretty basic, but I think it applies to to, to anyone. Um, the power of compounding interest. I won't elaborate on. I'm going to assume your audience knows that one. Um, if I it, it, I didn't have I didn't have a budget while I was starting my career in New York. I just was trying to do well on the job and have some fun at the same time. I probably would have had a an earlier, more disciplined approach to taking a portion of each paycheck and just putting it into the S&P 500 or something like that. Um, there's lots of other lessons along the way, but the, but I don't think you can beat the st start early because um, you can't start early unless you get control of, you know, am I spending more than I'm earning or, um, and if so, you can't start early. So it, there's, there's a lot of really positive flow on effects from it. Uh, and you're stunned when you look at those accounts 20 years later and go, I was putting tiny little bits in um, back then. And now it's, you know, it's this, uh, that's time. And it's very mm. powerful. Yeah. I like it. It's one of the, the most common pieces of um, advice that people would give their younger selves. And it's easy to see why. And I think a lot of people, you know, think that they can, they can invest their way out of a savings mistake. And I, I don't see that happening very often. No, and no. yeah, I've got to say, you know, it's it's obvious why um, it is such a good piece of advice. So uh, hopefully someone out there is listening who is in that situation. Maybe they're not they're probably not on Wall Street, but they might be in a good job and they're thinking, well, how can I make you know some of this go somewhere meaningful? And that's a way to do it. So Pat from Six Park, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me on the show today. Uh, it's, I really appreciate you uh, uh, having a chat. I always enjoy these kind of chats, Owen, and r really enjoy what you're doing. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.